members of color. Um, we're really excited about um, the information that's been prepared to share with you all um, this afternoon. Um, I am going to uh, read the bio that we received um, and I'm going to hand it over to Sean so he can get started sharing all these uh, great information that he has for you guys. So uh, Sean is the co-founder, COO and head of growth at After School HQ, which is a startup focused on helping K-12 students discover their passions through after school programs. He is also a Tech Point Tech 25 and 40 under 40 honoree and has served across multiple companies and industries as head of technology, engineering, operations, and finance. Um, I had an opportunity to meet him about a couple of years ago. I uh, think that there is uh, very few people uh, in the tech ecosystem with as much experience um, and knowledge. So we're really uh, fortunate to have uh, him here with you all. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to him. As you guys know, uh, we will leave time for you guys to ask questions um, towards the end of the presentation, um, get connected. And again, just a, uh, another reminder, if you lose connection, anything happens during this meeting, uh, just remember that all of our uh, lunch and learns, tech talks are all going to be uh, available on the Notion board for you to review um, later. So with that being said, I will step out the way um, and hand the session over. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. As Mark said, my name is San. I'd like to thank Be Nimble and Mentors of Color for inviting me on to do this Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm honored to be the first person doing a Lunch and Learn to kick off the series. Hopefully it's productive and informative. Um, we don't have, since we have kind of an intimate crowd, definitely want to make this conversational. So I love teaching. And so I always prepare a lot of material, probably too much. Um, but since it's a smaller crowd, just stop me if you want to ask questions. I am going to ask for some engagement in the chat. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. OK, cool. So you all see a cover slide that says digital marketing, right? Thumbs up. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to be talking about digital marketing today, obviously. Um, this is kind of a 101 type of class. So if I'm not giving you all the juice today, don't get mad at me. This is just an introduction. There'll be more. There'll be more classes to come. OK. So a quick overview of what I'll be discussing. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about the marketing landscape today. Um, intelligent marketing, essentially, like I'm going to give you my formula for how I think marketing should be done. Since it's mine, I call it intelligent. Uh, how to get started. So if you don't, if you don't uh, currently do digital marketing and you want to get into it, I'm going to kind of give you some tips on how to get started. If you currently are in digital marketing and you want to excel at your company, I'm going to give you some tips on how to do that. And the last thing will be why diverse marketers are needed, especially today more than ever. Um, the bulk of my uh, presentation will be on like my marketing philosophy. So just to set your expectations there. Before I get started, I do like to get like a gauge on the audience and know who I'm, I'm talking to. So if you could drop in the chat and I'm watching it here, the number that best describes where you're at and why you're here. So number one, you just graduated college. You're looking to get into digital marketing. Number two, you're entering, you're entertaining a career shift. So you're interested in like possibly moving over to digital marketing. Um, number three, currently doing digital marketing, but you're trying to get better. Four, you have a startup and you're kind of struggling or you want some tips on how to better market your product. Five, just happy to be here, just learning stuff. And six, if you got some other reason why you're here, just drop a description in there. So I'll leave this screen up. And while you all are putting in your numbers, I'm going to do a little bit more introduction on myself. So as Mark said, you know, I've worked across a couple of different industries. I went to Purdue, um, graduated electrical engineering technology. I left there. I was working in the satellite um, meter industry. So if you've ever had satellite cable installed at your company, somebody comes with a meter, they hook it up to the satellite dish. I was working on those meters. I was working on the firmware for those meters. Loved it. I love engineering. And it helped me to think in such a way that makes digital marketing and really understanding every other area of business a lot, a lot easier. It comes a lot easier as I've learned how to learn as an engineer and how to test things. From there, I moved on to work on like websites and mobile apps. Um, then I moved into the smart grid industry. So utility companies, they have equipment around the city that they can shut down 
in times when there's peak usage on the grid, I would actually work on the hardware and I'd also work on the head end software so that the utility company could shut that stuff down. Um, and so I learned a lot of stuff around IoT. And then from there, I kind of moved into the position as VP of engineering. Um, I've worked at I worked my previous job before coming full time on after school HQ. I was actually running a marketing agency. <clears throat> so I, I worked there as VP of finance, VP of technology operations. My last position before I left was COO. So I, I had the opportunity to see business from a lot of different angles. Um, I've really did, I really found out that I just enjoy I really enjoy learning a lot about different aspects of business. Now, coming over to After School HQ, that's when I essentially was like, all right, I'm going to have to dive deep into digital because I'm head of growth. So I had to dive deep into digital marketing and sales. And on the call today, I'll just I'll just shout him out as Trey. When it comes to sales and marketing, he's my right hand man. Um, he came in and he was he didn't he did not know about digital marketing. So he had to learn it on the job. We kind of learned a lot together. Um, so if you're interested in getting into digital marketing, um, which I didn't see any twos on there just yet, but um, maybe somebody will put a two in there to make Trey feel better. But Trey's kind of on here and he's good. He can kind of discuss what it's like to get into digital marketing from somebody who's just made a com complete career shift. So I'm happy to see some fives because I do have good. Oh, I see a lot of fives because so I, I do have good content around folks that are. Oh, that's just happy to be here. I see some fours. <laughs> so I see some fours. I'm good. I'm glad to see that because I do have some content around marketing your product. I see some threes currently in digital marketing and I don't see any others. All right. Well, appreciate it. All right. Perfect. Cool. All right. So um, let's get started with the first section here. Um, so the landscape here. So the goal of digital marketing really is the bottom line is you're ensuring that every day more people are aware of you of of your product and your services than yesterday. That's pretty much it. You're just trying to get the word out on your product and your services. Obviously, you're trying to make sales, but that comes as long as you're getting the word out. Every marketing campaign boils down to these four steps. <clears throat> you're taking a message, you're putting it into a channel, you're getting it to an audience and you're getting that audience to take an action. So message, shove it into a channel, to an audience, getting them to take action. So if that's all there is to marketing, why is it so difficult? Well, the reason why is there's so many things that can go wrong in that sequence of events. So when it comes to your message, it's your job as a marketer to test the heck out of your messaging to ensure it will get your audience to take action. The channel, there are gazillion channels out there. So you have to make sure that you're picking the right channels. It mainly depends on what channels your audience are tuned into. And uh, if you have a product that you're trying to sell or you're working for a company, under having an intimate understanding of your audience is key. If you don't have that, you're certainly going to fail. And the last thing is once you get your audience to a buy page or whatever it may be, getting them to take action is very difficult. And there's, there's a lot that can go wrong there. Um, this is kind of a landscape of the digital channels out there, search engines, directories, sites and blogs, content sites, social media, there's inbound, there's outbound, there's out of home. On top of all this digital stuff, there's other mediums for advertising that you should be that you have to think about. Um, so for example, vehicle wrapping, bus shelters, billboards, this is what we call out of home channels. <clears throat> so on top of all the digital stuff, there's also kind of what we call traditional media or out of home channels. Uh, when it comes to creating an ad, all an ad is, is a word plus messages. That's it. Um, this is an ad. It's just words and images. Um, the problem is, how do you know if you're using the right images? How do you know if you're using the right words? If you don't, you're just going to be wasting a bunch of time and money. Ultimately, people aren't going to be buying. You spent money. You've created ads. You're driving traffic. Nobody's buying. You're angry. That's you with flame shooting out of your head. So what are some of the reasons why people don't buy? You know, and, and if you are struggling with getting people to buy, take a screenshot of this slide because I've tr I've tried to boil them down to the ones that I've seen. So number one, you sent them to a purchase page, but they're they, they weren't ready to buy yet. Two, your buying experience is too confusing, and they lost interest before they could figure out how much how to purchase. Um, three, your product onboarding experience is too confusing, and they lost interest before finishing their account setup. <clears throat> Four, there was incongruence between your marketing sales copy and offering, so they felt bamboozled and bounced. So what that means is if you're if you have sales copy or marketing copy that's floating out there on the internet and they read that and they're like, oh, I bet this is what I'm gonna get. Then they go to buy and all of a sudden the product or service doesn't match up. They're gonna be like, oh, that, does, that doesn't match, I'm out of here. So th there could be an incongruence there. 
Um, five, your website product is loading too slowly, so they are bouncing. If your landing pages or your websites load too slowly, it increases bounce rates. I mean, I think it's down to like a third of a second and your bounce rates start going up. <clears throat> the last one on there is if you do have sales reps that are in the sales process and they're not, their sales script is not great, um, they could be selling the wrong way. That's another reason why you could be losing sales. This is an example of what it means to send somebody to a page before they're ready to buy. So when I'm going to hit play, and if you guys can't hear this, please drop a chat so I know immediately you can't hear it. But they're selling Af African ancestry. It's like a DNA kit. So check this out. Okay, I was kind of worried about that. You know how it would work out with uh, Google Hangouts. But essentially, you got a really good ad right there. Some of y'all might have actually seen it. It leverages brand loyalty. Because if you, if you, first of all, they're selling to black folks. And if you're black, you don't know who the Breakfast Club is. I'm going to have to punch a black card like three times. And if you don't know who Chadwick Bozeman is, I'm going to have to punch it like another seven. So they're leveraging the brand loyalty of the Breakfast Club. They're leveraging the like the um, the emotions because we're all attached with Bozeman. He's talking about the product. This ad probably has a very high click through rate, but just check out what they send send you to. So here they are on the landing page. You're checking it out. There's a lot of stuff kind of going on here, but boom, it's three hundred dollars. Raise your hand if you're willing to pay three hundred dollars after seeing that ad. No hands going up. So this is a really good example of. <clears throat> sending somebody to a buying page before they're really ready to buy. They need to be nurtured before they're going to buy. Actually, right, right down here, it says $27 per month. I would just tell them immediately, make that big and make that small. You might get more people to buy. So that's that example there. Um, now we're going to kind of move to with all of those problems, like all of that, all that, all those issues, how do you properly craft a marketing campaign? So first and foremost, you got to think like an engineer. Um, I have the advantage of like coming out of the engineering field, but engineers test everything. They don't make no assumptions. They test everything. They go by data. That's what you have to do if you're going to be a good digital marketer. Um, with all the variables, so you have the you have the message getting shoved into a channel that's going to an audience to get them to take action. It's a formula with a whole lot of variables. With those variables, where do you start to craft your campaign strategy? Where where should you start? And so I'm curious to know. Just throw it in there. So you have you have your audience, you got your message, you got your channel. Like, where do you think that you should start to, to do this properly? You could throw it in the chat. Okay, we got messaging. Got audience. You got ICP. Okay, good, good, good. So we got some folks that know some things here. There's a lot of folks that will give you a lot of different answers, but I'm here to tell you there's only one right answer. It's audience or ICP. So ICP stands for ideal customer um, persona um, or audience. It's the same thing. You've got to start with your audience. Um, so if you're going to define your audience, you got to ask yourself some questions. So number one, um, you know, name 10 customers you, you'd love to have. So if you've got a product company or service and you want to get some logos on your logo board, what are some of the logos that you want? Um, that'll help you to start narrowing down who your ICP is. What industry or vertical are they in? You know, where are they physically? Where are they physically located? Uh, what are their decision-making matrix? Like, what what drives them to make decisions? What are they measured by? If you're selling to CMOs, they're measured by like sales pipeline. Like, you got to understand their psychology. What communities do they hang out in? Um, what marketplaces and channels are they tuned into? What technology do they use? What triggers? Um, what triggers that makes this an urgent need? So, like sometimes. If you're selling to CMOs on LinkedIn, it'll let you set up a trigger. Like when a CMO gets a new job and you're selling sales enablement technology, you need to know every time a CMO, a CMO gets a new job, they're going to want to look good in their new job. They're going to be open to buy. So that's kind of what a trigger is. There's all sorts of canvases out there that'll help you fully flesh out your audience or your ICP. This one is one that's done by Tony Zambito. Um, it asks about the buyer persona, their goals, the buying process, buyer thinking, the way they think, why they buy initiatives. This is all the stuff you have to flesh out about your ICP. Even Amazon, as big as they currently are, 
started out with one solution for one ICP, and then they grew from there. So Jeff Bezos, ever since Jump Street, he knew he wanted to be the everything store, which is a mastermind. I mean, he knew today, what you see today was his vision way back when he started back then. Um, but he started with one ICP and he started selling books online. So one solution for one ICP. Um, <clears throat> so if you ask questions about their ICP, basically if you ask questions about the product, it, it helps you to understand the ICP and the buying process. So if they're selling books to males and females, the gender doesn't matter. Age probably does, because back then it was a big deal to buy something on the internet. So you need somebody old enough to have the internet, plus you need somebody who is willing to buy something on the internet, which it's not like today where you just press two buttons and you buy, everyone buys on the internet today. One like that back then. They need to have interest in reading. It's primarily a B2C. So that helps you to craft the sales strategy. So you have to know your, your audience. It's the very first thing that you need to know. Um, so I have I have a pretend startup and this is how we're going to do this exercise together. So my pretend startup. <clears throat> so actually, in um, after school HQ, one of the problems that I noticed is that it's very tough for founders, especially first time founders to calculate what's called the, the um, cost of the customer acquisition cost. That's CAC customer acquisition cost. Every time you talk to an investor or if you want to grow your company responsibly, you have to know what your CAC is because you got to know how much does it cost for you to acquire a customer? Because if you're spending more to acquire the customer, then the customer is paying you in, in their lifetime value. That's not a viable business. So you got to understand what your CAC is. This is a it's a tough it's a really tough thing to calculate. And most founders don't understand it. So the problem that my pretend startup is solving <clears throat> is um, calculating CAC is complicated. And many founders have no idea how to do it, preventing them from attracting critical rounds of funding. So I come up with a company of, called Cacify. Of course, the, the, of course, the logo has a cactus in it. And the value prop is my company, Cacify, creates software for B2B and B2C startups that helps them confidently measure CAC, allowing them to attract investors and grow intentionally. If you know your CAC, you can attract investors. You can make sure you're not spending too much. That's what my company does. Cacify, helping founders become cat confident. That's my tagline since earlier this week when I made that presentation. So who is Cacify's ICP? Founders, obviously, um, needs to be between pre-seed and series A. So if you're not familiar with those terms, it's like a, um, a, frank, it's like a, a window of time of when you're raising money. And during that time, people are really being hammered on for what's your cat? what's your CAC? Which are what's called LTV to CAC ratio. Are you spending too much to acquire customers? So that's when I want to target my audience. Um, their annual contract value should be between five hundred to fifteen thousand dollars. The lower you get in your annual contract value, the more you have to be careful about measuring your CAC. Because if you're spending too much again, then your your business is not viable. Especially today, people are being more careful about that. I don't care what industry it's. It could be ad tech, martech, ed tech, fintech, HR tech. Doesn't matter. Um, I'm specifically, if I was to niche down more, I want to look at I want to look at first time founders because they usually don't know how to do this. So that's a little bit about the ICP. All right, I'm going to pause there. So now that we know the audience, uh, you know, I want to ask this question. Drop it in the chat. Do you know where you go next? Again, because I'm dogmatic about the way I do marketing, there's only one right answer. And if you have any questions. Please, please just chime in. I can't see everybody's face, so I don't know if anybody is looking inquisitive or not. It's one of these four things. So we got the audience. What do you want to do? What do we what do we need to figure out next? Thank you. Thank you for Whitney for willing to drop something, drop something in there. <laughs> I see some more coming in. There you got it. So Whitney got it. Moni got it. And Yesenia got it. I hope, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. The next thing is the action. That's correct. So you want to ask the question, what action do you want your audience to take? Got some experienced marketers here. Um, I put this in here because it's really important to understand the funnel when you're talking about what action you want them to take. This is pretty busy slide, but if you're, you know, marketers refer to the funnel as, you know, tofu, mofu, bofu, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel and the actions that you get people to take at different sections in the funnel are very different. 
So if you're at the top of the funnel, it's attraction, it's awareness. You, you know, you can't get somebody to buy. That's the problem with the ad that we saw. They're at the top of the funnel. They're just making people aware. Can't get somebody to buy. That's not until you get down here to the bottom of the funnel. When you're in the middle of the funnel, that's when you're giving them uh, educational material like eBooks and surveys, getting them to do checklists, those sorts of stuff, things. So back to this, um, to this like ad, like I said, they're trying to get them to buy too early. Um, I, you know, what they could have done here actually, I think would have been really cool is um, this click through rates probably very high. CPC is probably pretty low. Um, and so the ad agency, they're doing their job, right? What they probably should have done was send them to a download where um, if you get this download and you see, all right, the, the diaspora of black folks all around the country can trace like, you know, like 25% of them can trace their lineage back to Nigeria. You know, 10% can trace their lineage back to Sierra Leone. Like that would have been really cool material to have somebody download, get them excited. Now you got their email address. That should have been the action here, in my opinion. That's how I think this would this would be going a whole lot better if they did that. <clears throat> so let's pretend that for CACify, we want people to start a free trial. That's the action that we want people to take. So now that we know the action, what's the next step? What do we do next in those four things? 50-50 shot on this one. Audience, action, what's the next thing? Fifty fifty shot, everybody. <laughs> it's either channel or message. Okay. And uh for what for um Monique, I was asking what's the next step that you focus on? We got the audience, we got the action was second, so third, it's either gonna be the channel or the message. We got and folks know what it is. Whitney and Monique, you all got it right. So now that you know what action you want to want them to take it's time to craft your message <clears throat> um so i won't get into the exact system but we actually we actually took a digital course Trey and myself that taught how to do this piece of it with with like engineering precision so if anybody does have a product company or wants to learn it's called mint cro it's not cheap it's not cheap at all but it is definitely worth it but the part that you do here is you start crafting a little message variants and you start putting them out there to test so for i want to get people to start a free trial here's my message variants um first one are you a first time founder struggling to measure your customer acquisition costs get started for free with cacify to finally know your numbers um so here are the components or the elements of this message it says are you a first time founder if you're a first time founder and you read that you're like oh yeah that's me you got my attention right struggling to measure your customer acquisition costs hey that's me too that's my pain point element Call them out, go to the pain point. What, what you want me to do? Um, you obviously understand me. Get started for free, right? So that tells me there's a free way to get started, a free trial with Cacify, that's obviously the company, to finally know your numbers, that is the result. So that's one variant. Another one could be attention, first time founders. Are investors stumping you with questions about customer acquisition costs? So I'm testing another pain point right here. Get started for free with Cacify to become cat confident quickly. That's my tagline that I'm trying to push out there. We'll see if it works. Um, last one, first time founders, are you haunted by runway and spending too much too fast on sales and marketing? Pretty much every founder, um, I know Mark is in here, he's probably feels that stress, you know what I mean? Every, every founder is haunted by this. Um, are you spending too much too fast, worried about your runway? Get started for free with Cacify and gain control of your customer acquisition costs today. So there's three message variants right there, all according to a very specific formula. It's and so the last thing, I'm just looking at the question here. Does Cacify serve businesses only for customers with annual cost subscriptions? <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fictitious company, so I never even thought about that, but that's a good question. Um, no, it could be a month to month. Or it could be annual, or it could be annual subscriptions. Yep, no problem. All right, and actually, if you do month to month, you really have to even watch your uh, your CAC even more closely, just because people can drop off after three months churn. Okay, so the last thing is obvious: it's channel. So <clears throat> for this, I'll just tell you that if you're trying to create a product company 
or, or a service. And I just had this conversation with a friend of mine who has an idea for a, pro, a, tech, a, a startup. What I would do, this is my advice to you, is I would just, I would spend a bunch of time, I would create a sales deck and a concept, basically a concept deck with everything that you're trying to sell. And I would book 10 meetings. So for me with Cacify, I'm not gonna touch one line of code. I'm gonna build, build out my sales deck I'm going to book 10 meetings, 20 meetings, 30, 40 meetings with founders. Um, and then I'm going to try to pitch it to them and see if it's something they'd be willing to buy and how much would they be willing to pay? Because that's called that's called market validation. You're finding out before you spend money investing into building the product, you got to find out if people are going to buy it. Um, if you are beyond that and you want to test things like you already have your product, you're kind of already past that. The two channels is Facebook um, is very cheap way to do this and uh, outbound emails. I would actually say that outbound emails is, I mean, sorry, Facebook is cheaper than trying to do it through outbound because outbound, you have to have really, really high volume. It's a, um, trying to do that kind of volume for out for hitting people up with a message variant. It's expensive. It's tough. And it requires a lot of expertise. Facebook, all you got to do is go create it go into the ad manager, bust out an audience, throw your ads out there get, and see if you can get people to click through. That's it. And it's, you can do it in under, under a thousand dollars. So that's that's a little bit about just my advice for testing your message variants. <clears throat> so just kind of going back through that summary summary of the order of operations. Start with your audience. Ask start by asking who you're trying to reach. Action: What are you trying to get them to do? Message: What do you need to say to them to get them to do that? And then channel: Where are they hanging out so I can push that message to that channel? Oh, breaking news. Cacify IPO at $104 per share. I hope you guys got in early. All right, so the next section here is how to get started with digital marketing. So if you don't do digital marketing at all and you're like, and I, don't, I can't remember if I saw any, uh, two, any twos. I didn't see any twos. I'm not even sure how relevant this would be, but I'm gonna go through it quickly anyways because I think it's a really good um, exercise to do and you're gonna learn a lot. So if you, don't, if you don't know anything about digital marketing, here's my recommendation on how to get started. First thing is, anytime, anytime you're trying to do anything new, doesn't matter what it is, it's very tough. It's a mindset shift. Um, so remember this quote, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Um, so what I recommend you do is roll up your sleeves and just do it. This is my challenge. You can take a screenshot of this if you want to try to do this exercise on your own. And what I'm doing here, it's almost like when I was in college doing engineering, I would get these labs and you'd have to go in and just build a circuit or you'd have to go in and do the thing and you learn so much just from doing it. So what I'm kind of doing here is I'm giving you a lab, a challenge that takes maybe four to eight weeks. If you do this, you're gonna learn a whole lot of stuff. So the challenge is put together an ebook on something you are interested in. Could be anything. Um, if you're like, how am I gonna make an ebook? Use chat GPT. If you don't know chat GT GPT is by now, you need to find out because these tools are, are here to stay and they're going to make you irrelevant if you don't use them. Um, you can use Canva just to quickly design the cover. Create a quick landing page on Unbounce, Squarespace or lead pages for your ebook download. Um, create a, a Facebook campaign to target people with interest in your ebook. Then push people to download your ebook in exchange for their email address. Send them a thank you email. Last but not least, can't be afraid to spend money. So if you want to learn how to do this, you know, set yourself a little $500 to the side for a couple of like for your subscription to Unbounce or whatever platform you want to pick. Um, put yourself a little bit of budget for Facebook campaign. You know, $300 would be enough to do this to do this experiment. And you're going to learn. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you'll, you'll learn a whole lot. Now, if you're telling me, oh, saying I don't know how to make a landing page. All you guys, all you got to do is go into YouTube and type type in using lead pages tutorial on lead pages for ebooks and you're going to get a ton of high quality well-produced videos walking you step by step on how to set up a landing page in lead space the thing about youtube now is people are putting out such great quality you can learn anything on there same thing with facebook if you're like saying i don't know how to do a facebook campaign again go on to youtube and type in facebook campaign ad manager tutorial you're going to get some really high quality stuff that'll walk you through exactly how to set up the Facebook campaign. So that's what I that's that's the challenge to you. Take the screenshot, 
um, use chat GPT just for the fun of it, uh, because I was right. I was in my my room when I was my my bedroom when I was making the slide. I was like, if I was going to create a, a book, what would it be on? I was like, man, I kind of need to finish like the decorations in my room. So I was like, I'll do a I'll do an ebook on decorating your master bedroom. Right. So I gave it to chat GPT. I said, write out 2000 word ebook, 10 steps to decorating your master bedroom. Here are the chapters that it gave back. Set the mood with color, choose the right bedding, invest in the quality furniture, all the way down to don't forget the finishing touches. It wrote out the intro, it wrote out the synopsis for each chapter. So that's how you can get your ebook done fairly quickly. Just pick a topic that you're interested in. Because if you pick something that you're interested in, it'll just make your job easier. Because if you're, if you're doing something you're not interested in, you're gonna be like, why am I doing this? But doing something that you're interested in always helps to kind of push you um, across the finish line. Um, so using the campaign framework for my book, I know that the audience needs to be people who are interested in decorating. Um, yeah, maybe target people who are just just moved into a new house. That's a good idea because you know people are going to be interested in like, all right, just moved in. I need to know how to decorate. Um, action is download the ebook, the messages. You know, write out your messages, your message variants to test. Um, look up some ads for ebook downloads and just copy them. So this is this is an ad I just looked you know I looked up a couple of nights ago that's running currently right now for HubSpot. HubSpot is very good at getting you to download ebooks. When it comes to that middle of the funnel, I mean they got so many ebooks on so much different stuff and it is very high quality stuff. Like the sales team at After School HQ, we look at the ebooks, we look at their training material all the time. Like it's it's great. It's great stuff. So just copy it. You know, you, you just change out the wording here, change out the wording there. This one already performs. There's no reason to try to reinvent the wheel. The other thing that I would suggest for this, <clears throat> the other thing that I would suggest is, <clears throat> excuse me, before you before you decide what ebook, um, go try to set up a Facebook campaign and learn how you can target people because it's going to give you more ideas on what ebook to do. So just a quick story. I spent all this time making a, making a book, writing a book, and it was on a Bible topic that I was very interested in. And I spent all this time and money and I'm not, I don't feel like I wasted my money because I really wanted to write the book anyways, but I spent all this time and I was like, yeah, I'm going to, when I get done, I'm going to mark, market this on Facebook, get people to, to, you know, pay $19 or whatever for it. Only to find out that, you know, Facebook doesn't allow you to target people based on being interested in the Bible anymore. They stopped that a long time ago because of the misinformation and the stuff that happened back, you know, back then. So it collapsed my entire my entire campaign strategy just went down the drain. So I spent all this money making a product and I was like, dang, I can't use the channel that I wanted to use. Now, luckily, I could sh I just shifted to Google and um, PPC and that worked really well. I could get people over to my landing page for like 20, like as cheap as like 11 cents per click. So that's that's one reason I say, like, go ahead, go into the ad manager, set up a quick test campaign, <clears throat> play around with the audience targeting stuff. It'll give you some ideas of how you can how you can target people. It allows you to target people on interests and, and things like that. That's my tip. If you, once you get done with this experiment, this is all the stuff you'll learn. You'll, you'll learn how to create a landing page, how to build an email list, how to design and launch a Facebook ad campaign, how to use AI. How to use simple design tools like Canva, and most importantly, how how to make an audience take an action that you want them to take, which is why anybody hires a marketer in the first place. So all the great stuff that you that you learn is is you know it'll all come it'll all be a, a great byproduct of this exercise. Okay, all right, just checking the chat, make sure there's no questions. Thank you, Nicole. All right. So how to excel as a digital marketer. I'm going to kind of give you just like tips from things that I've learned in my career. I'm applying it to digital marketing, but I'll show you here in a second how it, it can work no matter what, you know, matter, no matter what discipline you're in, it, the same tips will work. So the very first thing you want to do is if you if you're trying to excel, get promoted, get noticed in your job, all that kind of stuff, get better. First thing you need to do is very, it's almost obvious is you need to decide to get better. A lot of people, they kind of get, once they learn how to do their job, and I've seen it a lot because I've managed a whole lot of people, it's like, sometimes you can just kind of get focused and be like, I know how to do it. And you're, you're never trying to improve. You're never trying to get better. 
and eventually you'll become irrelevant and get replaced. So it's a bad thing to do, but I've seen it happen a lot in my career. So you, you always got to be deciding to get better. Just every single day, you got to be deciding to, to learn and, and improve. Even at After School HQ, we have a really cool sales acquisition model um, and we can sit down and be like, yeah, it's there, it's ready. But Trey and I are constantly trying to tweak the funnel, trying to get better, trying to learn what, what's not working always. You know, you got you to make that decision and it's a daily decision. Second thing, this is a practical step. Explore tools that increase campaign success. So if you're a digital marketer, <clears throat> all of these mediums that you're in, why are people not taking action? Why are they not buying? Well, there's tools that will help you to learn why people are not buying. This is your lab. You are an engineer. This is your lab. You have to un you have to learn all the tools that will help you diagnose all of the issues that you're facing as the master of this domain. So keep learning more tools. The other thing is educate yourself on all the channels and all the tactics. So if I come to you and you're used to running Facebook campaigns and I'm like, hey, I want to get I have this event I'm trying to throw in Indianapolis. Help me to craft a strategy. What are you going to say? I'm like. Well, let's run a Facebook campaign. We we'll throw a geo target around Indianapolis and blast the city. But there's other things you could do too. There's all that out of home stuff that you can do banners, you can do bus wraps. Like if you if you just open your mind up to the other possibilities and other channels and other tactics, you don't have to become practitioners of every tactic because that's impossible. And it's a it's to me it's a I just don't it's a fruitless endeavor to try to become an expert at every single tactic. Um, <clears throat> It'll help you to craft the right strategy for your client or for your business because you know, you kind of know the entire board. So that's number three. Number four, think about the entire campaign from end to end. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with that. So it's like I've seen I've seen a lot of campaigns. There's like copywriters, there's designers and people are typically focused on just just their part of the campaign. And so they're not thinking about how my part of the campaign affects everything else all the way down to even outside the marketing department to the sales department. Like how is what I'm saying to this customer? Like we had an ad that we ran and we have a philosophy too. It's like, there's no division between marketing and sales at AHQ because it happens too much where marketing, the marketing department is like, well, I'm doing our job. We're getting you the leads and the sales department's like, well, these leads are trash. And everyone's just pointing fingers at each other. So we have no division. We all meet together, but we had an ad that we were running and it was making a certain kind of prospect show up on the demo. And, the, and they were like, this is what they're expecting. And the sales reps were like, why are you asking that? We, you know, it's not even our core offering. So then we had to, we had to go back and swap the ad out for something else, something else. Now, something like that in a, in a company that's divided because everyone's only thinking about their part of the campaign or they're part of the sales acquisition system takes three to four quarters to fix, but we could, we fix it in like three weeks because we're always meeting together three, four weeks. It, just, it didn't take that long for us to fix it. The last thing is making your goal to move from being a practitioner to a strategist. When you start on any channel, like say you start on Facebook marketing, first people are going to be like, here's the ads, load them, launch it. Then they're going to be like, why don't you design the audience and the targeting? Then they're going to come and be like, hey, our CPC's going too high and our CTR is going too low. You can you optimize it? Yeah, I can. I know I know enough now how to optimize it. Then kind of like the last step is like, hey, I need to do this campaign. And now all of a sudden you're like, here's exactly what you need to do. You might even be like, by the way, Facebook's not even the right channel for you. That's being a strategist. So you want to push yourself to 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 move from being a practitioner to being a strategist. So, all right, I'm looking at this question here. How do you feel about T-shaped marketers, marketers knowing something in depth and then having general knowledge of? Yes, I, I do. That's exactly what I that is my philosophy. Never heard it called T-shaped, but that makes sense because you're going deep into one thing and surface level in the others. That's exactly what I'm advocating here is. Um, <clears throat> learn something in depth, you know, and that's typically how you're going to come up through the ranks of marketing. Anyways, if you're a marketer, you're going to know your discipline really deep. And then what I'm saying here, educate yourself on everything, learn everything else surface level, because that's how you become a director. Like now all of a sudden you're conducting the campaign. You're like, Hey, you do this copywriters do that, this, this, and that. And that's how you, that's how you will move up in your, in your company and move from being a practitioner to a strategist. So T-shaped marketing all day. This is, I was talking a little bit about the tools. Um, so if you're asking the question like, all right, why are people not buying? There's tools out there to help you. There's a whole discipline called conversion rate optimization, which is the process of increasing percentage of conversions from a website or mobile app. Um, so, you know, if nobody's converting on your landing page, I don't know, does anybody know what these tools are? 
smart look, full story, hot jar, optimizely. Like you can actually go look at recordings of people on your landing page and see like, oh, they're getting stuck right here. Like Google Analytics will only give you so much like scroll depth. It'll tell you like people are making it 60% down the page and then bouncing. But these tools will actually replay the sessions. So you can go see what somebody got stuck and where they're getting confused um, and then optimize the page at those places. So know your, know your tools. So I'll just quickly say how this worked for me, just being an engineer. I wasn't cognizant of the fact that I was applying these tips, but just by doing it, I eventually became the VP of engineering at this company. But I was really curious. I wanted to learn every single tool to troubleshoot and develop products. There was a, a problem that we had where I was like, man, I need to know how to look at a signal at a specific frequency to solve this problem. So an engineer from the other side of the wall in the production was like, well, you need a, you need a spectrum analyzer. I was like, a spectrum analyzer, what's that? I said, well, it'll help you look at signals at frequencies. All right, cool. So he wheeled one over and I looked at it. I was like, cool, um, I solved the problem. I have a new tool that I know. So by the time I was done, I knew how to use all the tools, spectrum analyzers, the oscilloscopes, everything. Um, I was constantly in other people's cubicles looking at their, you know, what they did. So the circuit, the circuit board designers, the, um, the uh, hardware designers. So I wanted to learn about all that stuff. So I knew how the entire product was built. Um, so it allowed me to understand everything from how the product case is built to circuit board design, to firmware, to telemetrics, how the, the products wirelessly communicate. So before long, I was able to craft the, craft the strategy. So if you wanna create a rapid prototype for something, they know they can go to SAN and SAN's like, all right, here's how we're gonna do it, lay out the plan. And eventually that's what got me promoted to be the VP of engineering. All right, so I'm gonna pause there before I get to this last section. I know I'm throwing a whole lot of stuff at you. Hopefully it's not too much, too fast. And if you wanna come off of mute and just have a conversation or ask any questions that may be in your head, I will wait for an awkward 10 to 20 seconds. <laughs> Mark, how's it going? How am I doing? Hopefully Mark's still here. I can't even see him. I can only see one, two, three, four, and then a box of eight people. I see Whitney. Mark had to leave because he had another meeting. Oh, Sorry, gotcha. Yeah. OK, I do see a box that has eight people in it, but I don't know who they are. Yeah, we have. 13 people. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, if there's if there are no questions, can you see the chat box because there are several questions? Okay. Um I have been looking at the chat box. The last thing I see was uh Whitney's question about T-shaped marketers, which I did go and answer. Let me see if I missed anything else. I have some online stores that this info would help with. Um and other than that, I can't hear, which was from the video messaging mm -hmm. yeah so i don't I didn't, I didn't see any like other questions the one about cacify i didn't see anything else sam yes hi this is monique um thank you for your presentation i'm in ux design so um you know a lot of the concepts that you did speak of uh i am learning in ux design i just appreciate the challenge of creating the ebook um mm -hmm. i thought about that all the time and it was encouraging it just starts with a single step because it can be overwhelming. Um, I don't know if this speaks to you, but you sound exactly like an engineer. You have a <laughs> lot, of, a lot of information um, that is useful. Um, it was a lot. I screenshot it a lot versus taking notes. I'm like, okay, I just have to screenshot this. Yeah. So I am just um, appreciative for all the information that you had. Oh, thank you, Monique. I appreciate that. Means a lot. Thank you. Um, if and if anybody, I am on. I am like officially. A mentors of color mentor so anybody can book time with me if there's something you want to talk about deeper but I, what i'll do now we have 10 minutes left so i'm going to go through this last section here and it's kind of a bonus section it, it's 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 near and dear uh, to my heart um and i'm kind of approaching it from the um business perspective i think there's a heart behind it but i'm approaching it from the business perspective which is the question of like why diverse marketers are needed and you know, when I first actually came into the marketing industry, um, I was working at a marketing company and I was the only person of color. 
Um, but then I went to like an interagency uh, marketing kickball tournament. And I realized that I'm not just the only person of color at this company. I'm like the only person of color in this industry. So there was very tough for me to find and connect with or hire like, uh, like, the, you know, marketers that are diverse candidates. So market diverse marketers are needed now more than ever. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to, to touch on is before 2020, uh, there was very little thought put towards diversity and marketing campaigns. OK, like you can go look at the statistics. I know it both quantitatively and qualitatively working at a marketing agency. Very few times were we thinking about even diversity in our client campaigns. Um, but after 2020, it all changed um, and changed for different reasons. You never know the heart behind the change. But I, I remember taking these screenshots back then in 2021 of these companies. So this was Unbounce. This was HubSpot. This was Calendly and QuickBooks. And I could have took 20 more screenshots like this. The black woman became the face of every tech company out of nowhere. I'm sure that you all have noticed noticed it. My wife's a black woman. I sent it to her. I was like, what do you think about this? Like, on one hand, I was like, I did make me feel like good seeing representation in the campaigns. But at the other, si other side of things, because you understand some of the I guess you, you don't understand the heart behind it. You don't know if it's if it's like opportunistic and things like that. But the point is all of these companies had to scramble to pay attention to diversity in their campaigns. Why? Because they did not have diverse marketers in the first place. These are some statistics that kind of drive this home. In 1980, um, white residents comprised almost 80% of the national population. This is this is the source down here. So I don't know if we're sending the um, deck out, but I, I like to cite my sources. Uh, by, by 2000, the white population share dropped to almost 70%, 69.1. 2019 declined to 60%. Okay, now in, in 2019, for the first time, more than half of the nation's population under the age of 16 identified as a racial or ethnic minority. So my kids are in that age grade, age range. I have a 17 year old, I got 15 year old, then I got two more behind them. But when they get to my age, she, when, they're, when they're just old enough to work, America is going to look completely different. And it's it already looks completely different. So if companies are not considering diversity in their campaigns, they're in trouble. It, it is hurting their bottom line. This is why it hurts their bottom line. This was this. This is uh, the sources down here. But this is insights on a survey done to determine, especially specifically how younger folks, 18 to 25, um consider inclusive advertising when making purchase decisions i was really surprised to see auto was higher than like a beauty and personal care it actually was a top that's interesting to me but the point of this graph is these 18 to 25 year olds they make purchasing decisions based on what they see do i see myself in this or do i not am i is it feeling inclusive of me or does it does it not because subconsciously you're like i mean even if you go look at a I'm trying to choose between two restaurants for me and my wife to go to tonight. And one restaurant, I go on Yelp and there's pictures with some with black folks and, and white folks and everything. Another one doesn't have no black folks. Subconsciously, I'm like, it just makes you make a purchasing decision. It's just the truth. So the thing that I'm not addressing, I'm speaking, I'm sticking specifically on the business aspect. I'm not addressing the heart aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because that's a whole nother lunch and learn. Um, it is very important for companies to have diverse marketers. And you're, what you're going to find is that companies, the jobs, whereas like the Chicago University, they did that um, study on how, how difficult it actually is to get a job when you're black, just based on your name. Um, this stuff is going to, sh to shift as companies recognize by the time their kids are in their 20s, America is going to look completely different. It's, 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 it, that's where it's, it's headed. It's, it's already looking very different, as I showed from the statistics. Uh, so with that, like if you look at it optimizely, this is their homepage right now. So you can look at companies and see that the marketers care about diversity because they're they're trying to be more inclusive in the images that they put out. It's something that that's like that's something that we all have to con we all have to consider as we as we do our marketing job. So that is let's see, I think that is it. Um, thank you for listening. I am at five minutes. 
So I did want to leave time. I know that it can take time for people to warm up to ask any questions about the presentation. I will stop sharing. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any final questions, then I'll just, you know, I'm hanging out. I'm ready to answer some questions. Thank you. I have a question. Oh, oh yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Monique. I'll go after you. Um, can you hear me okay? Because I had to put my ear pods on. I yes, don't we can. Keep talking. Thank you. We were, me and a good friend of mine, uh, we were actually having a conversation about this yesterday with the language that, you know, us as people of color, Black people, that a lot of times that we were deemed like maybe we couldn't comprehend as well. And some of the, even when you talk about diversity and marketing, we were talking about like we just, uh, we speak differently. Our vernacular is very different. And I'm not talking about any type of like, um, lack of uh, cognitive ability or anything, but our our words are different, our thought process is different. And um, we were saying just the need to understand that um, our our way of communicating is, is unique to others, but is very at home for us. And so we started kind of like looking at different things that we grew up in and we just kind of had like a healing moment, you know, as far as like, Hey, no, we understood everything that we were saying that, you know, that was said to us growing up as far as like school and stuff. But we, but we like had a light bulb moment. Like we weren't just figuring, you know, comprehending things. We had to figure out a whole nother language because things weren't marketed to us at all. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that's where you were going to as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've been in situation. So at the, the marketing agency that I was in, there were campaigns that we, can't, I can't say too much about because it's it would it's actually under a contract right now. But the the target audience was kind of shifting towards Marion County, and um, I actually did it did some street interviewing on 38th Street and also in um, you know on the campus um, and then also in Broad Ripple, and to just just get just get some feedback from folks that were trying to market in these different demographics. So when the campaign shifted to focus on basically black the black population in marion county the the literally the the marketing copy copy that was being used did not shift and i was like this copy is not how folks talk so if you use this copy with this with this audience your action is going to fall completely flat and that and that what you're talking about when it comes to literally like you know like take take uh take black folks out or white folks out it just doesn't matter what population or community it is um if you don't bring somebody that knows that from the inside to help craft those campaigns there is no way to fake it and we can see i've you you can see and i've seen like when companies do try to and it's and it turns out quite embarrassing there was somebody who did this um TikTok on companies that were trying to market for juneteenth sales and it was it was hilarious some of the jokes on there I probably shouldn't say while it's being recorded, but he was just kind of making fun of how all these companies were trying to market um, their sales during Juneteenth and how bad, how poorly it came off. I remember some of the companies as well. Um, yeah. I just, I definitely just seen a parallel uh, between that and just kind of like, you know, we're going to look up, like we're looking up now, you know, so many years later and just like, wait, we under we just weren't represented in a lot of aspects and so that's what we're seeing now so i think it's important you know to have these moments and also like to be in these industries so you know we understand the language that markets to us and, and make better uh, and make decisions about things that we want to need mm -hmm. absolutely thank you monique all right well we are one minute it's, it is now one o'clock so i'm going to hand it back over to is there somebody on the the be nimble side that will to wrap this up or should i just wrap it up my and, and excuse everybody you can do it like if anyone else has any other questions uh mm -hmm. do you have like a linkedin profile link that we can share so they can connect with you your email yep. either way guys uh this session will be uploaded tomorrow not, not tomorrow on monday and you're going to be able to rewatch it if if needed so do not worry Okay, I'll just drop my LinkedIn on the chat there for anybody that wants to connect with me. Trey, you can share yours too if you want to. 
Trey might have just dropped because he I think he might have uh, had a one slot. All right, well, thank you. Thank, uh, well, again, I'd like to thank uh, Be Nimble and Mentors of Color for allowing me to come on today. And um, this was a lot of fun. I uh, had a great time talking to each one of you and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you, guys. Chat soon. Bye.